Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting on Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? Yes, pursuant to general provisions of Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move the board to meet in closed session to discuss performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials from this public body has jurisdiction to perform administrative function, to conduct collective bargaining, negotiation, or consider matters that relate to negotiations, and to consult with counsel. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions or comment on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to go into closed session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We will see you at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Good evening, welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education open meeting on Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. I'd like to start this meeting by the Pledge of Allegiance. Everyone, please stand. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. December meeting, we have our elections uh, for the... Uh, for the new board officers. Uh, do we have a consensus that we will proceed with the board elections by roll call vote? Do I have consensus? Yes. 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 Thank you. I would turn this now over to Ms. Pauls, who is our acting executive secretary and superintendent. Thank you. According to section 4-102 of the education article, at our first meeting in December, we must elect board membership. Are there any nominations for the office of board president? Uh, Madam Superintendent, <clears throat> I would uh, like to nominate Richard Smith. Any other nominations? Okay. For the Office of President, do you elect Mr. Richard Smith? Ms. Jackie. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Mr. Cipinelli? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Merced? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. <laughs> I will now turn the meeting over to your new board president, Mr. Smith. He will proceed with the election for the office of board vice president. Good evening. For the office of vice president, do I hear for any nominations to be elected? I would like to nominate Mr. Mark Schifanelli for the office of vice president. So moved. Can we have a roll? We don't require a second. No second on that. Non, -nom non nominations, no. Any more nominations? Any more nominations? Hearing none. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Ms. Borsett? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Mr. Chiffinelli? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Hey, good evening. Uh, I want to welcome our new board members, Mark and Helen, to our board. Um, and a little bit of, this has been a tough year for us this past year since March with COVID. We've had a lot of challenging times and gone through a lot, um, but we're getting it, we're getting it down and we're gonna move forward. And I appreciate all the support I'm getting from this board. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Mr. Chevinelli? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Uh, Smith. And uh, I, I don't speak for Helen, of course, but I know we're both looking forward uh, to moving ahead and uh, uh, guiding the school in the right direction and we'll give it our all. Thank you. On my part, I'd just like to say that it has been an honor and a privilege to serve on this board and this is the second time being president. So I, um, I love this county, I love our people, everyone I work with here. So thank you all for allowing me to have been here again. And I would also like to say, uh, along with Ship, that I, I'm ready to move forward. I'm honored and I'm humbled and I'm ready to um, I feel the responsibility of what we have with all of these children and, and parents and uh, teachers to be um, respectful and to, to move us all forward. So thank you very much for your support. Motion to approve the agenda. Okay, okay uh, anything, Michelle, you've, okay, ready? All is good and welcome. <laughs> welcome to the board. Thank you. Okay. okay, we move to approve the agenda for this uh, board meeting. Do I hear a motion? I have a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, next agenda, approval of minutes for November, open meeting for November the 18th, 
and approval for minutes for December the 4th open. I make that motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we now have to go into recognitions. Uh, Mrs. Pauls. It is my pleasure this evening to recognize several folks. Um, the first one for recognition is Mr. Ronald Wilson. I'm not sure that Mr. Wilson is with us this evening. Um, I think when we had to change the date, he had a prior commitment, but we will recognize him in spirit. So Mr. Wilson was being recognized tonight for being a valuable employee at Queen Anne's County Public Schools. In the spring, when schools were closed due to COVID and Mr. Wilson worked every day to deliver school mail and supplies. Many of the employees were teleworking, but Ronnie was here every day during the height of the pandemic. He continued to deliver supplies, mail packets, deliver packets, and he even helped create some of those student packets and deliver them to families. So today, we would have recognized him for his valuable contributions and willingness to go above and beyond for our families. So we do thank him and we'll make sure that he gets a certificate um, tomorrow. And as his supervisor, did you have anything to add? I would second those comments. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next we'll be recognizing um, some members from the Bayside Elementary School staff. <laughs> My pleasure to recognize the members of the Bayside Elementary School staff. We have with us Nancy Krim, teacher specialist. Louisa Welch, principal. My name's Steven. So, Ms. Louisa Welch is the principal of Bayside Elementary, and last year Bayside was recognized as a Maryland Blue Ribbon School, which is quite an honor. In the past years, we've only had one other school who was recognized as a Maryland Blue Ribbon School. Students and staff were honored by Dr. Karen Salmon, superintendent of Maryland Public Schools. Their most recent honor, and to my knowledge, the very first for Queen Anne's County, as a National Blue Ribbon School. This most recent honor is bestowed by the United States Department of Education. Bayside Elementary was honored on Friday the 13th, it was their lucky day, not unlucky day, in a virtual ceremony along with 367 other distinguished schools, only seven from Maryland. And I had the honor of, of viewing that and I was so very proud of the Bayside Elementary School. So the National Blue Ribbon Schools program recognizes public and private schools based on overall academic excellence or progress in closing achievement gaps among student groups. Bayside is recognized also for a positive, warm, and welcoming environment with high family involvement where trusting relationships are fostered by all. And I can attest to that whenever I walk through the doors of Bayside Elementary School, I feel welcome. Two student, two student center questions are, do you know me? And do you care about me? And there is a resounding yes to both of those at Bayside Elementary School. So today we congratulate you on your honor as being recognized as a state and national exemplary high performing school. So congratulations to Bayside Elementary School students, parents, and staff. So. The first honor will be bestowed upon Mr. Stephen and recognition of his outstanding efforts that resulted in this national recognition. Congratulations, Stephen. Yay. Can I get a fist punch? Good job. 
<laughs> okay, and next we have the principal of Bayside Elementary School, Ms. Louisa Welch, also recon in recognition of your outstanding efforts that resulted in national recognition. <laughs> Notice that they're wearing what color? Blue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we have uh, Ms. Nancy Krim also in recognition of your outstanding efforts that resulted in this national recognition. And the day that they were honored, uh, it was amazing. Everyone was dressed in blue, the, the students performed, and they had a special treat. Stephen, do you remember what your special treat was? <laughs> no. Okay, it was a while ago, but they had blue cookies, and every student had blue mouth <laughs> and a blue tongue. So congratulations for your honor. We're so very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Let, me get, let me get a picture. Get a picture oh, sure. first, guys. Here, come here, Steve. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Nice seeing you, Nancy. Thank you, Bye, Louisa. We're smiling under these. I, I can see it. All right, all hail. <laughs> what else would a dance teacher do? <laughs> So it was brought to my attention that we had not honored our teacher of the year this year. Oh and I said, we better get it out of the way. So it is my pleasure to honor Mrs. Amber Wright, Queen Anne's County, 2020 and 2021 Teacher of the Year. So it is my honor to recognize Ms. Amber Wright, Queen Anne's County Teacher of the Year. She is a dance teacher at Kent Island High School. She began teaching at Graysonville Elementary School unbelievably 25 years ago. And I remember it so vividly because I was also there as a teacher specialist. Um, and she was the same vibrant person then as she is today. So she began at Graysonville Elementary School. She also served as certification specialist here at Central Office and even returned a year ago to support the district when we were in need during a transition period. Dance has been her passion for years, including her years at Salisbury State University and performances at other venues. She was nominated by her student, Abby Skaggs, and is extremely grateful to her administrative team and her family for their continued encouragement. She is most thankful for her son, Andrew, AKA her co-pilot and traveling partner. And to her students, she owes many thanks for this prestigious award. To Mrs. Wright, Queen Anne's County Public Schools owes her dedication to our families and for her excellence in the classroom. So again, congratulations. Thank you, Ms. Cole. Queen Anne's County Teacher of the Year, congratulations, Amber Wright, in recognition of being named Queen Anne's County Public School Teacher of the Year, December the 9th, 2020. And if I counted correctly today, the pictures that are on the board, I think you're like the 29th Teacher of the Year. Right. <laughs> so con <Please. laughs> I think, we, I think we have so, two of them up there now, don't we? Well, we do yeah. have two teachers of we the year. We have two. Miss <laughs> Holmes and Miss Wright. Thank you, So congratulations. Thank you. Turn around, get your little picture. Thank you so much. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, yes. My goodness. And on behalf of Queen Anne's County board members and public school, we have a small gift for you. And it just happens to be in a pink bag. I love it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, moving on, uh, we have board staff involvement, board members. COVID. Just, uh, COVID. Uh, we, uh, just to have a discussion, we are starting the superintendent search 
um, by the end of this month. Um, we just contract with MABE, finish that, finalize that, and we're moving forward. And um, yesterday, uh, Mrs. Harper, and Mrs. Pauls, and myself met with uh, the county commissioners in our uh, monthly uh, Liaison. meeting liaison meeting with them discuss and I had a couple staff members there too to answer questions and some things that the uh, commissioners know like capital projects um, curriculum and what you know what's going on with the COVID so we're trying to keep everybody informed um, there is a new president and vice president of the county commissioner so it was good to meet with them and looking forward for the new year and uh, meeting with them on a monthly basis Mrs. Paul. Yes. So I've been a busy little beaver in November. Um, we've been holding monthly meeting or weekly meetings with principals just so that we are up to date and on the same page. So they've been leveled. And we've worked on things such as schedules. We've started to look ahead for graduation. We have really started to delve into our data and um, Ms. Forbes will share some of that information with you in a little bit. And as a result of some of our data, we have uh, worked on some recovery classes and some booster groups as well. So we're really trying to provide some supports for our students in advance. I did, as I say, participated in the National Blue Ribbon um, ceremony. I visited Queen Anne's County High School, Centerville Middle School, Church Hill Elementary School, Sutlersville Middle School, Sutlersville Elementary School, and Church uh, Centerville Elementary School. I even ventured out to field hockey practice because I know one evening they were very concerned um, about just starting the new season. So I was able to just walk out on the field and see everything that was taking place at the high school and it was very well done. Um, I've had participate in supervisors district wide PD today and I'm happy to say that we had over 500 members to dial in and most of them for a session on um, emotional, social emotional learning. And I know some folks have had some issues about how we're supporting those students during the virtual learning. And so um, Mr. Evans will talk a little bit about that, but it was the sessions were very well attended and very well done. Um, as Mr. Smith said, I attended the county commissioner's meeting along with Ms. Towers and um, also Ms. Pullen. And um, today started to work a little bit on evaluations for the curriculum and instruction team because they are a little bit outdated. So I've been very busy. Thank you. Our next agenda item is citizen participation. Sir, student board members. I'm sorry. Sorry, That's keep okay. me straight. Student board members, I'm sorry. Alexis. Stay near me. I, I'm staying right here. Hi, everybody. Hello. Alexis Gross from Ken Allen High School. Uh, so to begin in November, we had our 21st annual food drive, and it was a drive-through. Uh, it was put on by our DECA team our DECA marketing class, and in the matter of one day, we collected over 2,000 canned foods and box foods to donate to our local food bank. Um, we also had our November Student of the Month. It was delivered by Harding and Miss Bryce on November 30th to the students' homes. In December, we're having our quarter two interims uh, sent out on December 11th. And then each week in December, our SGA is putting together weekly virtual events to count down to break. So in our first week, we had a March Madness type competition to decide on the best Christmas movie. Uh, and we also had a this or that poll. Second week, so today we had a dress up your pet in holiday wear. On the third week, so we're having a gingerbread house contest, and last week we're having an ugly sweater contest that takes place during your first period. That's great. And then at the end of December, we're going to have a December Student of the Month where Ms. Bryce and Mr. Harding will go and deliver awards again. And then lastly, just to bring everything together, our admin has been in direct contact with any students, and they've made over 150 home visits to help those students in any way possible and then just the new schedule changes. So SGA has been in contact with Mr. Schreckengoss to give any student feedback. Thank you. Beth? Natalie. Natalie's been.
Thank you, Ms. Pullen. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, guys. Hello, Ms. Doing? Natalie. How are you? Good, how are you? Um, Natalie Smith, Queen Anne's County High School student member of the board. In November, we were super excited to announce that 16 seniors were accepted to Salisbury University during our virtual college admission day. And then also in November, students were able to register for dual enrollment, spring semester classes, keeping in contact with our guidance counselors. Um, also, we did an Operation Christmas Child shoebox drive. We do it every year through our Interacts Club, but this year it was a little bit different. Um, but basically the fundraiser is to make sure children that are a little bit in need to make sure they have a Christmas. Um, and then several fun other fundraisers took place in the month of November. And in December, we are looking forward to more fundraisers and information about them can be found in our weekly Thursday communication. And then year 2021 yearbooks are on sale and purchasing information can be found in the Thursday communication. And then they are set for delivery in fall 2021. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to citizen participation. Um, I'll go over this right now. Okay. Um, God, every, everybody understands that guidelines are speaking at our regular, uh, regular board meetings. Um, right now, since we're in quote unquote somewhat of a little bit of a lockdown because of our numbers, we're going to take virtual things. They will all be posted on our website. Um, we would please ask you to print your name and address on those letters so they, when they are explained. And also, as soon as the numbers get back, we will have participation at our regular meetings. Moving on, presentations. Our first one will be monitoring data, Mrs. Forbes. So while Mrs. Forbes is coming in, uh, Ms. Forbes is our supervisor of accountability. And um, in the past year since I've been here, we have always had the superintendents to visit the schools and they've taken a look at the school improvement plan. Um, we share any data that we might have. And because of COVID, we have not been able to do that. So we've done some in-house measures where we have collected some data, analyzed some data, and Mrs. Forbes will share some of that data with you. Now, um, be prepared that because we have been virtual for most of the of the time. Um, the data is a little bit different than what we're accustomed to, but bear with us as we work through the plan and um, we have some suggestions for what we've, what we've already um, implemented to ensure that we meet the needs of all of our students. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening, President Smith, Ms. Pauls, members of the school board and executive team. My name is Julie Forbes, and I am the supervisor of accountability, assessment, and data management. And tonight, I am presenting the quarter one monitoring data for the 2020-21 school year. So our outcomes of today are to summarize the quarter one grades for our QA CPS middle and high school. So the secondary schools report on the quarterly basis. So those are the grades um, we're gonna discuss tonight. We're gonna compare those grades with the grades at the same time period from the previous school year, 2019-20, review possible reasons why those grades changed and also discuss action steps. So again, those are reported for middle and high schools. Um, there, the quarter grades are reported. There's also interim grades that are reported prior to. Uh, the interim grades uh, were reported right around the beginning of October. Um, that first quarter ended October 30th, and those progress reports were issued and sent out. Um, the quarter one progress reports were issued and recently sent out to families on November 2nd through the 6th, and we're actually in the midst right now of the interim reporting for the second quarter now, so we're actually gonna have another set of data that we'll be able to pull really shortly to kind of do some progress monitoring. And then the final day of the semester is January 25th, so it's just kind of a way of being able to continually check in on how our students in our secondary schools are doing and report that progress to families. So, 
<clears throat> these charts capture the difference between the grades that were distributed in 2019-20 and 2020-21 school years during quarter one. And they're broken up by the letter grade categories. So it's the distribution of A, B, and C grades, the A through C, and then the D and E grades is how we separated them out to kind of see the difference. So you can see in 2019-20 at the quarter one, 91.55% of the grades were A's, B's, or C's, and again, total distributed grades. And in quarter one of this year, um, that was 75.78% and the difference is uh, just under 16% of how those grades did change. And you can then see with the two charts to the right, the difference between our middle schools and high schools, just to break it down a little bit further. Um, the differences are relatively close, um, but there are some differences between the two, so did wanna share that. And so looking a little more closely at our middle schools, I did a further breakdown by grade level. Um, and again, you know, when we pull these big data sets, we really want to start getting to kind of those those layers and those smaller layers so that we can start talking about action steps um, and the steps that we can take. Um, so again, looking at the grade levels and looking at those percentages of distributed grades, you can see that sixth grade, uh, the students in grade six, the A through C grades that were distributed was about 81.4%. Seventh grade was 76.9. Eighth grade, 79.6. And so that starts to give our middle schools um, kind of more of an area of focus. So as you can see, the grade level with the highest number of A through C grades was sixth grade and seventh grade with the lowest for our middle schools. And then a further analysis of the actual courses, these are the basically the top five courses that had the highest number of D and E grades. Um, and it was contemporary world history, math grade seven, math grade six, science grade eight, and science grade seven. And again, to start really being able to focus and take a closer look at that data because there's a lot of different ways we can look at it. And similarly for high school, um, you can see the breakdown of those A through C grades by grade level and the um, as the students get older, those A through C grades increase, and as they are younger, particularly in ninth grade, you can see that's the lowest, uh, the lowest distribution of those A through C grades at 66.4%. And again, looking at the courses with the highest number of issued D and E grades, Algebra one, Biology, Geometry, Spanish two, and Government. And there were other courses, but again, this was to kind of focus on those courses with the highest number. Um, of those D and E grades. And the purpose too was to let everyone know how deep we had really delved into the data. So we had really gotten into the numbers, the grades, and also down into the courses. This just gives the administrators of just a little bit more information of where to focus mm -hmm. um, professional development for, for their staff. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> We have looked at this data um, a number of times. I have met with all of our site principals and had one-on-one -on -one meetings where we've reviewed a much larger data set and, and looked at their individual school data, members of their leadership teams, um, and they've been looking at this data all year as well. So it's not the first time they've seen the data. They are doing this tracking and progress monitoring at the school on a daily basis of monitoring their students and being, discussing ways to further support their students. So when I I talk about why did grades decrease. This is um, this this was gathered from those conversations with the schools, um, with all the information they have at the site. Why do they feel those grades decreased? And um, so some of the items that came up were, was the lack of student engagement. So students who aren't engaged are struggling in their coursework, um, missing assignments, internet connectivity came up, um, and that one. <clears throat> you know, really has layers to it. Because for some students, um, it's just unavailable. For some students, it's available, but it's inadequate. Um, and so due to the bandwidth, you can only really perhaps run one program at a time. Um, and for some, it could be cost prohibitive. So that internet connectivity is just, there's again, layers to it. Attendance um, kind of ties right into the student engagement piece. 
learning gaps from spring 2020. Um, some of the sites are observing that students are, those, those learning gaps were getting bigger, and so that was contributing. Uh, another item that came up was the reduction in, in paraprofessional staff. Um, the paraprofessionals are actually in the process of returning, and I believe many have returned. Um, and so that's something that has changed recently, but that was something they reported. Um, another thing that was reported was that there's just sometimes there's limited help available for students during the school hours when those synchronous class hours are occurring because families are working. So families are working at the same time and may not be able to you know be there one-on-one -on -one with their child because they're working as well um, the start time at the middle schools was an item that came up because their schedule um, starts it's it's around between 11 and 12 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. depending on the site um, there was also some schools that reported they're having families opting to move out of the advanced tracks particularly in mathematics so students who were in those higher level courses are choosing to um, not be in those courses anymore inconsistent attendance at the morning virtual small group sessions so <clears throat> some of our schools are offering additional small group sessions in the morning but they're not getting the participation they'd like to see and then um, <clears throat> lack of participation during the synchronous lessons and discussions. So a student perhaps is logged into the Google Meet, but maybe not engaging. Um, and, and that can look a few different ways. And then just overall, too, student difficulty with organizational habits, because students are managing different courses, different assignments, and having to really be organized about all of that um, was something that was reported. Again, as reasons that the schools reported that for the students who are struggling, these are, these are things they observed. <clears throat> and then this next slide captures what our schools have been doing um, really since the spring, continuing into the fall, um, and then things they're, they're um, going to be additional steps they're taking. And I think something important to highlight here is because of the proactive steps our leaders and our instructional teams and our teachers and our staff have been taking, um, I would say the number of D's and E's probably would have been much higher. And so because of the steps they've been taking, um, you know, and that might not be something we see initially in that data set, but they have that data at the site because they've been doing, they've been logging it, tracking it down to the student level, recording, you know, just documenting the way they're supporting kids and trying to reach out. So uh, the steps that have been happening that are going to continue are weekly student success meetings, um, tracking of student successes and challenges. Again, you have, you know, interdisciplinary teams talking about students and ways to engage them, ways to support them, and, and keeping track of that. Uh, continuing student and family outreach efforts, uh, phone calls, text messages, letters in the mail, emails, um, pretty much any method of communication possible, our schools are engaging in that. Uh, the continued use of translation services to reach families, making sure that we're reaching them. Um, in the correct language. Uh, referrals to student services teams and services as needed, so looking at, you know, not just the academics, but the whole student, and are there other academic pieces um, or are there other resources that they could be connected to? <clears throat> Our pupil personnel workers, the PPWs, have been continuing to make home visits, so um, for some of our students who are unengaged, going to the homes, trying to engage them, have that face-to-face -face conversation. Um, <clears throat> some of our sites have been very creative on um, scheduling on-site meetings for technology troubleshooting, um, literally meeting people in parking lots so they can socially distance and show them how to log on and how to access different platforms. Um, parent-teacher conferences, uh, many parent caregiver sessions on how to use the various systems and platforms, <clears throat> and many of our sites have reported that when families are able to engage in that, they found um, that to be successful because you know parents, caregivers, students can ask questions um, so that they can successfully use those systems. Continuing. Um, additional support and tutoring, and it looks different across our schools. For some schools, it's before class starts, some it's after, some we're offering things on Saturdays, so continuing those things, whether they're able to do it in person or virtually. Um, <clears throat> the counseling staff, our school counselors have um, you know, been very, very involved, monitoring engagement, conducting outreach, again, really trying to um, touch those students and support them, continuing the distribution of hotspots, and then, of course, professional development for teachers on teaching and the virtual environment has been ongoing. 
<clears throat> so some of the additional steps that schools have been taking is expanding those translation services and tutoring services. And you know, some of our schools, again, coming up with creative ideas of you know, looking at your staff, even your world language teachers, to help with some of the translation needs and, and reaching families and students. Um, they're taking a look at student workload and assignments and seeing if there's support for students there. Uh, some of our schools are creating plans for positive incentives and recognitions, again, really trying to think outside of the box to engage kids um, and, and get them excited and involved. Um, continuing just to message families, sharing more tips, strategies to support students. Uh, some of our schools are evaluating their school schedules and looking at those, um, those times. Um, <clears throat> our high schools are looking at focused support for our seniors that are in danger of failing, and also just additional support for all struggling students. And again, really trying to think proactively about what else um, can be done. And now I invite you, um, if you have any questions or comments. Well, I guess the, the one question, and I know we've been set back with these numbers. Do you feel that these could turn around once we can get them into a hybrid mode of where students can actually come back and have some one-on-one -on -one with their teachers? Will that be a significant change? Um, I think the same supports would be in place for mm -hmm. those students. What we're finding out is the biggest issue is those students that are not, they may log on, but then they leave, and then they don't do any of the classwork. So for those students that remain virtual, that would still be an issue for them. Of course, for those students that are in person, we would be able to, to work on that um, because they would be with us. So that's the dilemma that we're facing, and we're not quite sure that students understand that in the this, in this spring, it was a pass-fail. And until they've started to see grades now, they realize that they are actually being graded. So we have seen a few more students um, log on. Um, but as um, I believe as Alexis said, you know, the um, staff at Kent Island High School, they made 158 home visits. I mean, that's amazing that the administration has stepped out to really um, work with those students. And I know Queen Anne's, we didn't have that data here, but I was at the school a couple weeks ago and they were actually making phone calls to students. And the students were elsewhere, some of them weren't home. And so the message was, you need to, you need to get to work. So um, hypothetically, we would probably say yes, but again, it would depend on which students and what the reason was that they were not being successful. Certainly most of them are not being successful because the supports are not there. It's just that they, um, some of them, with the, the shift in the um, schedules, high schools, especially not starting until 10 o'clock, they're sleeping in, <clears throat> some of them are working. So there's a, there's a, a number of factors, but. Um, there's also the connectivity issue in North County. It there. keeps being, it's brought up, you know, repeatedly that there's still that connectivity issue. And we brought this up in front of the county commissioners, uh, Mr. Smith and I, about how they were supposed to bring Fios down to help North County and, you know, it, it stalled. Yeah, and I've had a few parents to reach out and, and we troubleshoot together if there is an issue where their child just can't get on and there is someone to support them or be able to, to take them to a location where they would be able to to get internet services. So, you know, we don't just say, no, you're in, the, you're in a location where connectivity is not good. We troubleshoot and provide supports for them. Because I can see in the lower grades where parents are there, where, their, where children cannot be left alone, but when you start getting the older children, it must be very hard for them to understand they need to, I mean, they need to be in school all day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they're not in school, they're in a different surrounding um, home or, like you said, possibly working um, and not getting support. And people have to understand that we're back to the real world now, not pass-fail, that, you know, we're working on the standards that they need to meet to move on. And, and um, 
I, 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 you know, I, I, I don't know. It's a hard thing to do virtually, I'm sure. It is, but we also have to realize that even though students are in high school, they still need parent support. Mm -hmm. So I've had parents say to me, you know, I overslept and so did my child. <laughs> and so again, it's, it's getting them into a routine, which is why the high school has really started to look at a schedule, which we won't get into it into a lot of detail. And hopefully they'll be able to come and explain those schedules. And it's, it's not very appealing right now, especially the students, because the schedule for virtual would also mirror the schedule for hybrid. So it would never change no matter what mode that we transition into. But what it does is it gets the high school student up earlier because that's what they're accustomed to. And it keeps them in a synchronous learning mode where the teacher is actually teaching them four classes a day. So it mirrors a little bit more of what they are accustomed to. Um, the, the periods are a little bit longer, but it's they're not as long as they would be if they weren't a full day. So we're um, we're gathering feedback on that, and we're continuing to um, to really analyze and um, make the decision to to move forward. But we really think that it's it's a good um, schedule for our high school students, and it would help them tremendously. And I know it's coming from your leadership. It's also being bought in by our principals, our high schools, and their I mean understanding. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know we came up with this model back. It was all new to us in March. Mm -hmm. Bam, it hits us, we do this. We've learned a lot, and we're allowing you know these principals to really um, take the bull by the horns from what I say. Well, we have amazing principals in this county, but our two high school principals were the ones who came to me and said, we need to do something with the schedule. So they really are leading, um, you know, they're leading the charge with this, and they feel adamantly that this will help to meet the needs. We've also gone back and we've identified um, seniors who are in jeopardy, and as soon as we can get students back in school, um, we have a plan, recovery classes for those students. So we want to make sure that every student has every opportunity opportunity possible to be successful. Um, and we did do a survey. Um, Julie had sent out a survey. And when parents were asked the question, what has gone well for their child, um, the, the, the feedback was pretty good um, regarding Google Meet. Um, you know, we had real positive responses with that, the use of the program Schoology, synchronous learning. So we are getting some good feedback that the virtual learning is working for those students that are engaged um, in that learning. So, um, you know, we have some negatives. And we also have lots of positives. Um, parents, uh, students have become accustomed to virtual learning. Students are thriving in a structured virtual environment. Um, parents are playing an active role. Those were some of the positive um, comments. So some others that we will address when uh, Matt comes in were students feeling, you know, uh, like social interactions. So you're always going to have a balance. Well, any negatives that we can work on? To, I mean, anything that can be worked on to? Well, students are not engaging in Google Meets, and so. Um, getting students to turn on cameras. Uh, principals are having, um, you know, in their the syllabi that go out that students need to be engaged for the entire time in order to get, um, you know, credit for, for the class participation that day because they're just logging in and then they're going back out because the attendance policy kind of says that as long as they log in. But we really need them to be engaged for the full time. Once they log in, they're in. But how do, is there any way to monitor that they're still there or not? Real, yeah, saying. you can see when they check out, when they leave. Okay, so there is ways that the, mm -hmm. the, the yeah. teachers can keep it. Yeah. Yeah. This, this also will work, I guess, if, if we get back to the hybrid, but if we had a snow day or switch back and forth, if you're on the same frame, then it would be kind of your virtual or your hybrid in, that, in school. Yeah, and so the schedule wouldn't change for wouldn't high school students. All. It would okay. be the same schedule. They would heal, still have the same amount of uh, instruction. And we talked a little bit about that today with principals, with Ms. Um, Pullen, talking about what the, uh, the inclement weather would look like. So, Mrs. Paul, are you saying that, that when they check in for the class, say, could they leave the computer, though, and they still look like they're in the class if they don't have a camera? If they don't have their camera on. So if I'm in a meeting and um, I need to go to the bathroom or someone walks in the office, Jackie has a message for me, I can turn my camera off. But they can still see whether I'm in the meeting or not. And then I turn it back on. So some kids don't turn their camera on and some of them 
log on and then log off. And, and I'd say too, I think some of our teachers are doing some really creative strategies to address some of those pieces. So um, in Google Meet, they have the ability to do polls. Sometimes they'll ask interactive questions just like you would in a classroom. So um, I think they're, they're aware and they've been um, looking and coming up with some really creative strategies to make sure, even if the camera's off as well, to make sure the student's participating. I know in my son's classes, to get credit for attendance, you have to answer an attendance question. To, it introduces you, when you log on, there's your question for the day. That's your attendance. If you didn't answer it, you're not marked as present. Now that also gives the student, if they can't get on during class because they're working or there's no connectivity, they can answer it later that night and get credit for attendance for the class. So they're, they're also using that little tool. So they have to be interactive at least a little bit to get credit for being there. So on your slide seven, uh, missing assignments are in the ability to help these kids recover grades or save their grades before the end, are assignments encouraged, are we encouraging teachers to keep these assignments open for completion or so is there yes. an assignment recovery? Yeah, yes, we are. They, I mean, there is a length of time, but we have been working with um, teachers. If parents say that you know they've been late with an assignment, um, then most are given the opportunity to turn those assignments in. So um, we've been providing lots of opportunities for students to, to actually um, change their grades, move their grades. Well, I'm just thinking with Christmas break, if parents are home, that could be an opportunity for them to sit down and really start catching up on things students have been not prioritizing or falling behind on. And we've had some issues too where um, there's been some concerns about the amount of work, the workload mm -hmm. that students are getting. And as soon as we receive that information, if it comes to me, it's sent right to the schools and the um, principal or the academic dean works with the teachers on being able to manage the workload and um, you know what's, what's appropriate for students of that age, so. Okay. Um, but I mean, the other thing is when in school you're there, what, six, six and a half hours of instructional time? I mean, eight to two or whatever. But you know, that, that same time has to be dedicated at home too. And if they're, you know, I mean, you take you start taking a half an hour here or an hour there, it, I think it really affects, you know, your ability to stay, stay, stay up on it. Yeah, that's what the new schedule addresses. It gives them longer periods of time. Um, we were a little bit out of compliance with the number of hours for high school students, so we've beefed it up. Um, now they, for synchronous learning, it's um, usually 3.5, but we're up to four. Okay. Um, and if we didn't have to allow for the transition time for buses to take students home, and um, transition time, we have to have 15 minutes built in between the change of classes. So, you know, it, there are some disadvantages as well well too because we have to uh, you know accommodate the the transitions and the movement so it's just unfortunately the world that we live in um. thanks so, miss Forbes or <clears throat> miss Pauls given the current and future steps that you've outlined are we expecting an uptick in grades from what they've dropped recently come January 25th or end of the semester yes yes we are Okay, and last question. Are there schools that are ready to go hybrid? Um, just coming into this, and I know it's not particularly on the subject for tonight, but are there schools that could be able to go hybrid sooner rather than later, say in January? So that's what we were really looking at. And today in meeting with principals, we were talking about, okay, which small groups could we begin to bring back? The problem is the COVID has really attacked our staff. So we're up to at least 70 um, staff members that if they either tested positive or have been exposed. And when we start to bring children back, students back, we just have to make sure that we have support uh, for them in the classroom because there's no sense in bringing them back if we have um, teachers that are that are still out. So that's the problem that that we are really facing. I mean, we 
still have a few students coming in here and there who just don't function well with virtual learning. Um, and we've tried to, to you know, accommodate them and meet their needs. But the, the biggest problem right now is that our, our staff population is really being um, hit pretty hard with, uh, with COVID-19 cases. Is this a part of the discussion about the reopening that's later on? It would have been, but I wanted to address that as well too, so. Well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Forbes. Okay, next on our agenda will be uh, Mr. Evans. So next we have Mr. Matt Evans, um, Supervisor of Student Services. And I know there's been many concerns about uh, how students are um, really faring um, as far as being um, in the virtual world, isolation. And it's always good to hear from the student board members as to what types of things are still happening at the schools, even though it's in the virtual wor world. So we're still trying to keep up that stamina and support all those activities that um, students would participate in, but of course it's different. And on this survey that um, Ms. Forbes uh, had sent to parents, one question was my child or children have adjusted socially and emotionally to virtual learning, and it was the lowest score that we had. It was a little over 60. So it was it's something that we have been paying close attention to, and as I stated earlier, we had professional development with over 500 employees logged in today for this session. Um, principals, even secretaries, school nurses, um, counselors, just everyone that we could um, could possibly be engaged. So um, everyone is paying attention to the needs of the students. So, Good evening, President Smith, Ms. Pauls, members of the board, executive team. My name is Matt Evans, Supervisor of Student Services here in Queens County Public Schools. So my first presentation, as Ms. Pauls said, is on social and emotional learning. Um, really the purpose is we want to overview the zones of regulation curriculum, which is something that we are, have, are pushing out district-wide this year. Uh, we also want to overview other SELA programs that are currently being used in Queen Anne's County Public Schools, and as well as other social and emotional supports that existed prior to the pandemic and, and currently are in place now. The zones of regulation curriculum, and, and again, this is uh, being pushed out, pushed out systemically uh, through all schools. And really, it's just a, a cognitive behavioral approach to teach students how to how to recognize their emotions and teach them the skills to regulate their emotions. And and the the goal is that you know certainly they can learn how to regulate themselves in the demands in the classroom as well as it, you know it transfers into adulthood into society. Um, some of the basic ways that, that we are, are teaching the vocabulary and, and the curriculum is um, the actual zones are colors, and, and there's not a good zone or a bad zone. You can be in between zones, um, but you can see just some basic descriptions of what it is to be in the blue zone, green zone, yellow, and red. Um, and further, really, uh, if, if you get into more detail about the definitions of the four zones, you're looking at uh, the state of alertness. And the green zone is when we are, are at our best. You know, it's regulated, we're, we're alert, we're paying attention, we're able to engage. Blue might be uh, tired, sad. Yellow could be uh, anxious, maybe even excited, but you know, you're still losing some regulation. And ultimately the red zone could be where you have intense feelings of anger, rage, panic, or terror. Um, and again, the goal is to one, and it's not only students, but staff as well, because you know, there, there has been a lot of stat, uh, stress and anxiety through all this. Um, and, and our goal is first to have you know, staff to be able to regulate or recognize it within themselves, um, use those self-regulation skills so that they're comfortable when they when they roll it out to students in the classroom. Um, and again, some of the um, outcomes we're looking for besides student progress and engagement in the classroom, but things that, that transfer into adulthood or you know, persisting on complex long-term projects, uh, problem solving to achieve goals, delaying gratification, being able to save money to uh, to, to buy a vehicle, uh, and just self-monitoring and, and, and rewarding yourself when you achieve goals as well as, uh, you know, kind of regulating our behavior going forward. 
uh, just a timeline of, of how this is being rolled out this year. The training, we, so every uh, school sent at least one person for a training in August in the zones of regulation. Um, those points of contact, as we're calling them, ultimately then uh, formed an SEL team within our school and, and are currently providing training for staff. And they did an initial training in, in September. Um, and currently now through December, they're really learning about more about the zones, emotional tr uh, triggers, uh, the vocabulary, and, and um, just tools on how to roll it out to, to students going forward. After the winter break, is when we're looking for all schools to introduce to introduce the zones to students zones of regulation some already have um, but we really were looking one to have that deadline of january um, and then going forward you know schools would implement at a pace appropriate for each school some some schools are a little ahead of others and and uh, and that's that that happens uh, but we do certainly want to implement it district-wide um, throughout the, the spring semester. And then over the summer, we definitely want to review the data. We're in the process of data collection now, uh, look at maybe uh, some kinks that happened and, and look to plan for the next year. Current data regarding zones of regulation, 86% of schools received the initial staff PD. Then that, it was 100% of the points of contact had that initial training from the company, but then since then rolling it out, 86% of, of our school staff have received, uh, or schools and their staff have received that training from um, the SEL team. 90% of, of those staff surveyed believe in the value of implementing and, and that it would support student learning and outcomes. Uh, 86% percent of schools have incorporated uh, social and emotional learning into their SIP plan, and that was a recommendation uh, from Tiger Team 4. 73 percent of those schools have formed an SEL team and have met at least once, and again, that was a recommendation from Tiger Team 4, where we want them to meet monthly as they're planning, you know, how to support staff and students with the rollout of, of this SEL curriculum. And finally, as I said, 50% of schools have, begun, have already begun introducing to the zones of regulation to students at some level. Um, some you know, are even actually have, have begun lessons in the classroom. Some counselors are targeting groups where it, it might be needed. Um, but in half of our schools, it's already being rolled out. And with the goal, like I said, in January, we would like 100%. Mr. Uh, Evans, yes. uh, for those who don't know what a SIT team is, a school improvement, the school improvement team, 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 team yes. play, I've been on three of them, so I, a lot of people here may not know what a, a SIT yes, team is. Yes, the, the school improvement team, and, you, and there's a school improvement plan in each school, and there's also a district school improvement plan. Thank you. Uh, other programs that are in existence, Queens County Public Schools, we have changing perspectives. This is actually great funded through the uh, Clifton Foundation. And we have 25 accounts in four elementary schools. Two in particular um, have a lot of, uh, have the majority of the accounts. And it's really more of a resource where they can access virtual social and emotional lessons and, and target particular groups. Um, and there's, there's a very good virtual component. So it's just another resource that counselors, teachers can use as well. We have teachers, counselors, and, and principals that actually have accounts. Um, and also a second step is a program Program. Uh, we have one that's currently in one middle school when they're, they're planning to roll out weekly lessons and social emotional lessons and also incorporated with the zones of regulation where the students are also learning about identifying those emotions. Uh, other social and emotional supports. This is what we really targeted with uh, school teachers, uh, well, really all school staff today. Um, well, one, um, school counselors and mental health coordinators uh, prior to the pandemic and the shutdown had been facilitating small groups. Uh, even last spring, they were doing that virtually, um, and that's going on now. Uh, and these groups depend on the school and the needs of the students, but typically topics are social skills, organization relationships, and self-regulation. School-based mental health was uh, what we really went through. Well, we talked about the referral process today in our professional development with staff members. So I put school-based mental health in quotes because you know prior to the shutdown, this was happening in the school. Um, the idea was that we would have providers, mental health providers, come into the school to provide that treatment so that uh, parents wouldn't have to take off work, students would have to miss minimal amounts of time in class, and and many times transportation was an issue for families as well. Um, 
So those referrals still continue to be made. We have 45 new referrals thus far this year. 80% of those referrals were made by the school counselor, which is appropriate. And that's what we, we reviewed again with teachers, that when they see something or, or know something about a student and they're concerned about, that they communicate that to the school counselor who then reaches out to the family and, and explains the different services that are out there and the providers to, that they can link them with. 15% um, of the referrals were made by the student support team, uh, which is also appropriate. That team exists in every school and includes the school counselor, the school nurse, administrators, uh, and school psychologist. And then you see 5% were made due, a parent, due to a parent request, and that's um, more than likely a parent was talking with the counselor and said, I need something for my child, and the counselor was able to say, we can make a mental health referral and, and link you accordingly. So uh, in conclusion, uh, teachers that are, uh, have already started introducing this to students have found that the zones of regulation check-in is helpful, allows them to assist specific students toward positive outcomes, allows them to know students that might not be, that might be in the red zone and may need something a little extra and they may need, they may check in with them outside of the synchronous learning environment. Uh, school counselors and, and have reported increased awareness and students being able to recognize their, their feelings and how that, if when they're in a certain zone, how that affects them, their behavior and achievement in class. Um, they also report extremely helping, helpful in assisting students recognize, you know, things that, that are out of their control and things that are in their control so they can uh, move forward accordingly. And finally, the mental health uh, coordinators that are, are having small groups have, have reported progress in social, socialization among students who are participating in these virtual groups. That being said, are there questions? I have a question, Mr. Evans. Yes. Thank you for this. Sure. Um, so what would that look like? I'm having a hard time understanding the zones of regulation. If, so if I'm a teacher and I'm teaching virtually, um, what am I looking for? What and you're closer to your mic. I'm sorry. I don't know if you heard me because you were I, there, I did, but I did. okay. So how would that look like if I'm a teacher and I'm teaching virtually and I've been taught these zones of regulation and we are saying we're rolling this out in January and you said it may or may not go within that program, but is that, are you asking, like what would that look like? What would I do if so, I... So initially teachers would child. start with, with teaching the vocabulary to students, actually introducing the zones, the red zone, yellow zone, and get them to recognize what it means. When you're feeling this way, you might be in this zone, what it means to be in the red zone. Uh, and from there, they, there's lessons that, go, that are in the curriculum that, that would go along and really we're looking and the goal would be two, two 20 minute lessons per week where you're kind of addressing those zones and different uh, self-regulation skills students can use to move them from maybe being in the red zone to more in the yellow. So the teacher, no one is making any assumptions or, or thinking this child might be blue or this child might be red. That's correct. They're making their own self That's correct. And that's, and that's a big regular. part of it for students to be able to, and, and staff as well, to be able to recognize you know, their emotions and what zone they're in. And then the goal is to teach them the skills to, to regulate so that they're making appropriate decisions and understand, hey, maybe I shouldn't, you know, uh, make this decision right now while I'm in the red zone. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, you're up, he's up again. So yes, I'm enrollment data. Give us some good news. <laughs> So I, I, I did do a brief uh, presentation on this in November, I believe it was, um, yes. but certainly it, it's good to go through again because it's student enrollment is very different this year. Uh, so the, the purpose is to over, overview the enrollment that was reported to the state as of new, uh, I'm sorry, September 30th, and that, that, that data is official as of now. Um, and we want to also talk about uh, data regarding students that are now home instructed in Queen Anne's County. Uh, we want to look at trends uh, in the latest enrollment data and also get an understanding of, of the school enrollment data. 
so here's the grid um, by by school and grade level. Our total enrollment now uh, for this school year is 7,421 students. I will tell you that is down 369 students from last school year, which is significant. We had um, been maintaining more or less a, a steady enrollment, but this is a significant decrease here. You can see in the uh, graph here, uh, you know, there's been some fluctuation over the years, but it's very clear this year there was a significant decrease. And this is over a 10 year period. And that data is consistent with other counties as well too. They're all the same percentage? Not the same percentage, but th their enrollment is down as well. Right. Across the state. Yes. Uh, looking at the fall enrollment by school, uh, we have totals. I, I, I will say that really, the, the, the biggest decrease in enrollment that we've seen has been in the elementary schools. Um, and we can say that every elementary school in the county did uh, decrease in their student enrollment. And again, here's a, a, a graph that, that shows that in every single school and in some fairly significantly. The middle school enrollment um, was not as much of a decrease. If you look at Mattapique Middle School, they actually increased their enrollment. Uh, that is due to they had a very small eighth grade class last year, outgoing eighth grade class, and, and a particularly large incoming sixth grade class. So that kind of offset it as compared to the enrollment from last year. But you can see the other three middle schools did have lower enrollments uh, as compared to last year. Grand Ends County High School is up. Oh, just, just looking at this graph, to me, when you say our elementary schools are down, it's the, 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 it's the highest. Do you think that's something to do with uh, daycare? Uh, possibly, sure. Uh, I mean, parents, you know, yes. I mean, where these other middle and high school pretty much can mm -hmm. be of their own and stuff like that. But when you got elementary, yes. um, there's an issue of, you know, I've got to go to work. Your schools aren't open. Not that we're supposed to be daycare centers, but we're not open. We then have to send our school kids to somewhere else because a lot of people in this society today don't have the option not to come to work. And, and you're right. There's there's a lot of uh, you know households where both parents work and, and daycare is very difficult to get right now. So it could very well be. Um, and I'll, I'll point out also, well, let me finish with the high school enrollment. Um, you can see that Ken Island had been increasing their enrollment up until this year, and then there was definitely the drop off. Um, Queen Anne's County's enrollment at high school has been um, continually increasing, um, and they're, they haven't increased this year as well, but also they, similar to Mattapique Middle, they had a, a large outgoing 12th grade class um, that kind of offset that data. Well, they had a, a large ninth grade class coming in. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, ethnicity enrollment, and this is new as compared to what was uh, presented last month. Um, really of note, uh, the black black students uh, have decreased slightly in the past five years. There's been um, a steady decrease in Caucasian white students in the past five years. Uh, multi race students has seen a, a slight increase, and Hispanic students have seen a steady increase in the past five years. Moving on to home instruction. <clears throat> this is really the significant data. Um, and typically we don't always report this in the student enrollment, but we, we certainly are this year because we, we did have a lot of families that, that transferred their students to home, home instruction or home schooling. Um, and that, that number is up by 319, I believe, 320 students as compared to how many we had that were home instructed the previous year. So we're, there's 329 students last year. Now we have 600. 49 students for this school year. Um, looking at that data, and this is again looking back at elementary, if you see kindergarten through second grade, that is where we saw the biggest jump in the transfer of students to home instruction. Um, and some of these kindergartners might have been um, already enrolled and then ultimately they, they changed their mind and transferred them to home instruction. But uh, I think elementary as a whole again represents the majority of this, but you really see uh, the, the difference there from kindergarten to second grade. 
In conclusion, um, again, our total enrollment decreased by 369 students. Um, the, this significant decrease, decrease can be attributed to the, the increase of students transferring to home instruction. We had families that transferred to private schools as well, but really the, this decrease in enrollment can be attributed to the transfer to home instruction. Um, as again, in, increased by approximately 319 students in the largest increase we saw uh, in grades K to two. Questions? I have one for this, uh, Mr. Evans, for the students who are, are doing home instruction, I assume they were telling why they were leaving. Um, do you anticipate getting most of these back when we so when they notify us that they're they're doing home instruction, they don't necessarily always give us a reason. They are required to say if they're gonna monitor their, or if they're doing their own program, which we would monitor twice a year, or they might register with the uh, umbrella group that's recognized by MSDE. And then that group just lets us know if they're in compliance or not. So there's not really a spot on the form. It is a state form where they say why they're doing it. Some uh, sometimes did. I would anticipate yes. And when I talk with my colleagues across the state, yes, we would uh, foresee if we were back in the um, in the in a normal sense where we were fully in the building. I would see a significant number of these students very well may return. Um, I can't say that for sure, but I did see when you were talking about the data monitoring and the grades decreasing, and part of it was with the learning gap from the spring. Now I'm assuming that we're probably going to see another learning gap from students who have continued in-person learning um, home and with the private schools. Are we going to be addressing? Um, that learning gap, um, I know it's still a ways off, but uh, for when they come back and they may face, you know, they, they may not, they're not going to be in the same place as maybe some of the students who struggled virtually. Yeah, so, and, and, and home instruction <clears throat> is, 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 is different because we're not involved in that at all. Um, and when students re-enroll, if they're at the elementary or middle school level, they very well, schools may, may choose to do sort of an assessment to kind of see where they are. Um, yeah, more often than not, we don't want to, uh, we want to keep them in the appropriate grade level. But if there are concerns, we do have to address it. At the high school level, is completely uh, has to do with credits, and if you are if you are in the high school and transfer to home instruction, order receive. If it's not one of um, the recognized programs by the state, then in order to receive that credit, they have to pass our county exam with the 70% or better to receive that credit as pass. They won't get a grade, but they will get the credit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But Ms. Bennett, mm -hmm. the students that are with us, we met with principals today and that was the conversation that we had um, for students who were not meeting with um, success to meet their grade level standards. We said, let's make sure those students are getting some type of intervention. And now that pairs are back, we can do things like um, have breakout rooms doing virtual instruction so they can still work in smaller groups as well. So, um, so we really are trying to address that. And we've even started to plan ahead for some summer learning and what programs might look like. So we'll come up with an A and B if we're in the virtual world, if we're in hybrid, um, what that might look like for students. So some of our Title I schools, usually summer school doesn't start until like the 1st of uh, July. As soon as school ends, we're going to be bringing them in. So we talked about doing an A-B schedule as well to make sure that we can um, service more students. So we're really trying to think ahead of how we can make sure we um, help to, to try and close some of those learning gaps that students are having. And one thing I think is neat, and nobody's, everybody understands this, but this is going to put a real burden on our financial system in the, in the county. Um, we're down 369 students, which maintenance of effort pays, or you get funded by your level of, of enrollment, both by the state and local government, which pays, the local government's paying over 55% of their budget into education, which I think is close to 50% of our budget, 50% of their budget is just us. Then what's gonna happen, I'm afraid. 47.5. Huh? 47.5. Yeah, I county? like the round numbers. <laughs> um, anyway, then next September, we get an enrollment and say these students come back, which we hopefully they will, 
will be a whole year before we recoup that money because we don't get funding until the following September the 30th. So I think we've got we got to be very diligent. Now, this system is in the same boat as every other system in the state. So we're not odd, but I think the state has to really look at this on how this is going to be funded and this anonymity that's going on right now because it's going to put especially smaller school systems in a very, very hard spot. You know, when you sit there and say this and we say, oh, we just, we'll lose 10 teachers. It's not 10 teachers because that, that's not just evenly 10 teachers all the way on. Miss Paul's probably can, <laughs> pulls her hair out on this. You know, it, it's just going to be tough. If you're a 20,000 school system, it's different than eight. Um, and it's going to be a real, real challenging time for us. Uh, and I think people need to understand that. Our uh, legislators need to understand that. And uh, the public need to understand that. It's going to be huge. Mm -hmm. It's going to be huge. If we are not funded using enrollment numbers from um, last the last year, it's going to be huge. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go Tigers. Yes. Okay, we're scheduled for a break. You probably feel like taking a 10 minute break and we'll return. Can we keep going? No, let's take 10 minutes and we're, we're, we're moving on all right. We'll be take 10 minutes and come back. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, Clean right. County Board of Chasers is back. Um, we have uh, current action items. I make a motion to accept the human resource and bu substitute bus driver report as presented in closed session. I have a second. 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 Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we have a policy uh, for board approval for student attendance policy. I make a motion to accept the student attendance policy number 503 and its regulation at 503.1. I have a second. second. All those, any discussion? All those in favor, I say it's an aye. Aye. Aye, aye have it. Okay. Now we're for board approval of uh, Grayson Elementary School PA system. Carla. Can I enter just for point of information, please? Um, Mr. Smith, you need to make the motion. Thank you. We have to have a second, and then we open it for discussion where Ms. Pullen describes it. Thank you. Thank you. Make a motion for PA replacement of Grayson Elementary School. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, open for discussion. Good evening, President Smith, members of the board, and Ms. Pauls. For the record, my name is Carla Pullen. I am serving as the interim chief operating officer. I'm here this evening to request your approval for a contract with HP Electronics to replace the PA system at Graysonville Elementary School. We are utilizing a cooperative purchasing contract for this purchase. That is an already bid contract that has been awarded to HP, and the school system is able to utilize that. This will replace the console the speakers, the wiring for the new PA system, as well as an online component that is going to allow the school an ease of change to their bell schedules and announcements, which is rather a cumbersome process right now. We are utilizing the fiscal year 2021 aging school program funds in the amount of $59,000. This is a program of funding through the state of Maryland. It is recognized as one of their eligible projects and for aging school funds, there is no required match from the county. We deem this project essential. The PA system, of course, is an element of life safety. It's part of our emergency notification in the building. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. So we didn't need um, three bids for this? No, because it is a procurement plan? Correct. It's cooperative purchasing. It's an already bid contract. Okay. Any other I, have a, I have a question. So did we replace it? Are we just replacing it because it's old? Is it not working? It's currently working. It was put in the school originally in 1995. So oh, it is that, end of it's... useful life and it is difficult to get parts. So we want to be proactive and make sure that we are replacing it at this time before we would have some sort of system failure. What happens to the old system? The old system at this point is not usable. Okay. So it would just be removed. On the proposal, yes. is this the only thing that we got? Well, there was no breakdown of money. You said how the 59000 was being spent. I just see units of... 
quantities? You know, ones, twos, four, one thousand. Is there? Yes, that's any? just the part pieces and numbers, not necessarily a breakdown of the the cost for each part. Do they not? Do they not give that? I Typically, mean, no, because this is a cooperative contract, so those parts are already spelled out under that bid contract. If that's something that you're interested in seeing in the future, we can surely add that. That would be great. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. The part of the motion, sir, point of information, please make sure that you say the name of the company and the amount of money that is being budgeted for. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we are going to approve the contract for HP Electronics and replace a PA system for Asian Elementary School for the physical impact of $59,000. From the Aging School Program. From the Aging, from the aging School Fund for FY 2021. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Eyes out. Thank you. Yeah, our next uh, action item will be approval of special education contracts. Can you read that motion? May I make a motion to approve three special education contracts for a period of August 1st, 2020 through July 31st, 2012, and budget in FY restricted and unrestricted operating budget as follows. Stride speech for speech pathologists in the amount of $58,275. Chesapeake speech for speech therapy services in the amount of $155,400. And Wendy Carpenter for occupational therapy services in the amount of $95,000. So moved. Second. Okay. Good, e Good evening, my name is Jolene Smith. I'm the supervisor of special education for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Um, Mr. President, uh, Mrs. Pauls, board members, and members of the executive team. Um, I am bringing to you this evening three contracts, uh, the two speech pathologist contracts, and really even the um, occupational therapist contracts are for vacant positions that we were not able to fill with direct hires. Therefore, we fill them with contractual positions. Um, all of the positions that are filled through contracts are vetted through our human resources department and the interview process, um, so they go through all the processes of you know answering questions um, being approved uh, we do background checks and we do um, reference checks as well and then they provide services to students um, in the school system as needed and this is the same thing we've approved over the last year or two with a being a short shortage of this person they will be hired for our full-time staff correct do I have any other questions? I have um, questions. On the first one for the speech pathologist, the statement says that this... Um, which first, which the, the, speech, the, the speech pathologist, um, it's strides speech. Okay. They said that the, they will provide three days of service per week. How many hours is that per day? Um, so it's, a, it's seven hours. There's seven and a half hours in a day, but it's seven billable hours. Okay, and this contract is for one calendar year. Do they work during the summer? No. So they're contracted, really, they're just working nine months of the year for three times a week? Mm hmm And how are we invoiced for this? Hourly, monthly, weekly? The invoices are hourly, um, and actually, depend if, if we were also speaking of the other contract, it's per school, per student. Um, well, this is just one school, though, right? Correct. Okay. If, but the other, um, if you were going to ask the same question for the, the second contract as well, um, they're per school, per student, um, per provider. It's an hourly invoice, which comes to us, we approve. It actually runs through, depending on the provider. In this case, it's they're all school-based. So it runs through our medical assistance billing person, and then it comes to me for approval. Um, and then it's invoiced on a monthly basis. Okay, so what is that hourly? Do you know what it is hourly that we're? Maximum amount on the contract is 37.5. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, stride speech pathologists. Stride speech providing three day service per week for 2020 21 school year, covering one school contract period August 1st, 20. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm going to read one, each one separately. No, just go ahead and do that one. Just, just do it one time? Mm -hmm. Yes. And not going to go each mm -hmm. one separately? No. Okay, let's go to the next one then. Yes, just go ahead and read that one again. This whole thing with mm -hmm. all three of them again? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
May I have a motion to approve three special education contracts? Now, why are we doing, let me just ask the procedures so I understand this. Why are we doing three if we're just going to do one at a time? We don't have to do one at a time. You've already made the motion. They were all three in the motion for okay, the amounts well, of money and saying the amounts of money. But then it, I want to make sure each board member has a chance to ask a question on each one of them. We've just okay. asked on the first one. Okay. Okay. This is now. okay. Well, that's what they can do that right now. I, okay. And I'm sorry. I do have one more question. I'm okay. sorry about that. So the most they can get, so three days a week, one person, seven hours a day for three days for nine months. For 10 months. For the 10 months, just to, okay. So that just 58,000, do they use all of that or that's just what we've allotted and they usually, cause it's not. That's what we've to, allocated. Okay. So in the event that say perhaps she was out for a day, she would not be paid for that day. She's only paid for the hours that she's actually providing services. Okay, thank you. So to make it clear to myself, and I hope the other board members are clear, we're, we're looking at strides, Wendy Carpenter, and uh, Chesapeake Speech. speech. Mm -hmm. So if there's any questions on any three of those that you're reviewing, if we're going to make a motion to lump them all together, then I'd like to make sure everybody understands that, and we're asked questions separately on each one of them. Um, and on there, it does show where the uh, physical impact is, and it's grant funded or whatever. Any questions, any questions by the board? No. no. May I have a motion to approve the three special education contracts for the period August 1st, 2020 through July 31st, 2012 and budgeted in the FY21 restricted and unrestricted operating budget as follows. Stride speech for speech pathologists in the amount of $58,275. Chest speak speech for speech therapy services in the amount of $155,400. And Wendy Carpenter for occupation therapy services in the amount of $95,000. You have to vote to say yes or no. Discussion. All finished. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jolene. Okay. The next thing is discussion update on opening of schools. So I think we've addressed a, 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 a few of the comments here, but um, one of the things that we really pay close attention to are the metrics. Um, which are which come out each day and um, I just kind of just because I'm a visual person I just kind of keep a record record of them over the days and um, the the first one that we pay attention to is the seven day um, positivity rate which is 9.7 um, and it's fluctuated Monday was 9.7 Tuesday 9.0 Wednesday 9.7 but the seven day case per uh, case rate per 100,000 is up to 36.3 which is the highest I do believe believe that it's um, ever been. Um, and the metrics that we follow are usually 5% for the seven day case um, or seven day positivity rate, and then 15 for the seven day case rate. We did uh, receive core uh, communication today from um, the uh, board meeting and um, Dr. Chan, who is out of Baltimore with the um, health um, officials. And it's saying that we don't have to follow it as closely as it is um, written. And I know that when we close back to virtual, we were over our metrics um, at that particular point because we kind of held off as long as we possibly could. Like we were up to like, I hate to say it, but we were up to about like 18 and 19 seven day case rate. Um, but the positivity rate was, was a little bit um, above the five. So um, that's pretty much what we use. I have conversations with Dr. Ciotola, um at the health department and we kind of talk about, um, you know, what's safe and what's not. And um, right now we're just, looking at metrics. We're also looking at the number of staff cases. Um, student cases are a little bit harder for us to, to keep track of because parents don't always report it, especially since children are not in school at this particular time. A lot of that is, um, you know, my kid's not in the building. I don't need to report it uh, to the system. And, and we have no way of knowing then um, what the student rates look like. But we have had um, some student cases, some positive cases in the school system. And some of those students have been in um, like for specific services, may have been like a you know a speech service or something of that sort, and um, concerns with uh, that impacting our staff, um, the staff rate. So, um, like I said earlier, we were up to about you know 70, 70 cases, which is the highest that we've ever ever been. 
Um, so that's what we're kind of using um, to decide or to make that decision for school. Um, there's not anyone in the system who doesn't want kids back, but we also want to make sure that everyone is safe and feels safe. Until the CARES Act uh, ends in, at the end of the month, um, we still are not staffed in, in every school. So that's um, still a real concern for us as well, too. Um, but what we'd like to do is to, to think about the first of the year is which groups we can bring back, like, it could be our seniors, you know. It could be, um, you know, some of our, our younger students, who not all seniors, but just some of them who, you know, have some um, need some additional support. So that's something that we have to make the decision on. But again, it's based. It will be based on the metrics. So I need to continue uh, communication, or whoever's sitting in the seat needs to continue communication with Dr. Ciotola, um, because the health department could say too high. That's it. Um, you know, we need to cease. So that's kind of where we are with the, with schools reopening. Well, the meeting with the county commissioners yesterday that was brought up, will we be bringing back the special education students as soon as possible? The CTE students, and we talked about the seniors. Um, yes. Um, and when we first talked about the CTE students, they were still in pretty good standing. Um, we would have to continue to look at their hours now since we've been out, what, um, two, three weeks, I guess, um, since we last, since I last spoke with the, um, the CTE folks. And um, students, according to many, according to their IEPs, they are receiving, they're still receiving services, some services. So um, Ms. Smith and I met today to just talk about how we are continuing to support those students that, um, that don't learn well in the virtual world. So we have a plan um, for that as well. Okay, thank you. So Ms. Pauls, the, the seven day positivity rate, mm -hmm. is that the county, based in the county or, or the state? Because you referred to Baltimore. County, it's the county data. That, that I keep track of. I don't pay too much to, uh, you know, attention to the state yeah. because it's usually a lot higher. But um, the data that I look at each each day, it's broken out by county. So I always just look at Queen Anne's County, often surrounding counties too, to just kind of get an idea of where they are as well. Sure. And did Dr. Ciotola, um provide or recommend a positivity rate for the students? I mean, when if we were to go vert, uh, I read or you know, in person to person, um, is there a rate established where if there is positivity above that rate to it's, shut down or? Um, well, it's the five and the 15 right okay. now. That's what they're adhering to is the five and the 15. But the guidance that we're getting from the state is, um, you know, we can have some wiggle room with that. So that's something that um, we would have to have a conversation with him about what he would consider a wiggle room. And um, he, he pretty much follows the numbers. <laughs> um, sure. T. So. By comparison, the state's <clears throat> positivity rate is 7.7%, okay. and the daily rate's 44.5. So our, our percentage rate is higher than theirs, but our case rate is slightly lower. And today, I know when I left work, there were 31 new positives on the list just today. And we haven't been able to isolate it in any one part of the county because that would be an easy transition to say, you know, if it's Northern County or, you know, if it's on the island, we can bring those schools back first, but it's it's scattered throughout the county. It really is. Do we isolate it by ages? Yeah, the data, the data is broken down by age, zero to nine, and then um, 10 to 19. Mm -hmm. And those cases have increased. Um, over the over the especially over the holiday, at first they were um, they were not alarming, but they have they have increased. So, and I'm sure when the outbreak happens in one area or a family, then it's going to affect two or three at a time. It's not just you know, and we're enclosed more now, so it's not helping any matters as far as the spread of it. Yeah, for outbreak, they look at like the, the, the key numbers, like five, and we thought we had one facility that was close to that, but not all the cases were positive. It has to be at least five um, okay. positive cases. So, um, that you know, that's another thing that we look at, and, and at, to this to this point, we haven't really closed our doors in any of our facilities, but um, we were we were pretty close in one. 
Do we have anybody in the schools at all? Oh yeah, every okay. there the school. If you if you ride by the schools, many of them parking lots are are full. Okay. Um, for teachers, it's easier to come in and use the internet, depending on where they live, in the school building than it is, um, you know, to use it at home. And they have, you know, all of the equipment that they need there. Uh, happy to say that the um, the Chromebooks for our primary students have been delivered, and schools have distributed them. I was at Centerville Elementary School one day this week and they have distributed just about all of theirs. Actually, a parent was coming in to pick it up as, as we were speaking. Um, we're still waiting on the cameras, but we anticipate it should be this week that they should be in. And he said that would be something he could get online pretty quickly. Um, well, it gives the, the teachers a little a better advantage for, mm. for seeing all their students as, as they're teaching, and it gives them more mobility in the classroom so they can move around, have a little bit more um, latitude. So, um, yes, we do have folks in the building. Um, uh, broadband with, are we still working on that or any updates on that? I have not heard of any updates. I'll need to check with Josh to see if he's heard anything. I, mean, I, I remember him telling me he had to go through the state and then right. find out how it comes back down. And are we supposed to get a report to that? Either this week or next week. He is. Yes. Yeah. They're going to increase the bandwidth for the school system to two gigs through the state. We have to apply. Have to apply for that. And uh, Mr. Coombs, who's had the tech specialist, had applied for it, and they've done so. Hopefully, the survey and ha will let us know if we can get to two gigs. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks. Okay, information items. We have policies for first uh, read for public review, policy number 602, advanced placement programs and regulations 602-1, and policy 616, gifted and talent identification and instructions and regulations 616-1. Be out for the first read. They are going out for the first read. Um, so to uh, let the other new board members know, I sit on the policy committee for the board, um, and we, the Policy committee recommends that these policies and the regulations go out for first read. Thank you. Any questions or and that and we you know we have a lot of policies we're reviewing and going over, so it's something that um, I think is a, yeah, is, a we deep, meet, is a deep project is a deep thing we have to go over and stuff like. Yeah, that. we meet once a month, and we we think in the pipeline we have what 15 that we're looking at at least uh, 15 to 20 policies that we're going to be looking at and putting out or or even rescinding because they're outdated and obsolete. So, so we'll be so bringing that to the board members. And any input the board members has should probably be the best thing to go through Tammy. Uh, any things like that, they can, you can read them, look at them, go on our site or you know get them pulled up for us. Right. So these are for a first read tonight yes. they're yes. being presented? We, did, we don't have to vote on them, they just go out. No, there's okay. Just like we just voted on the student attendance policy that had, had been gone out for a first and second read, so, um, that went through the policy committee. Okay. On the distributed to section, how is it determined who we're sending this out to for comment? The stakeholders that are listed there, they are sent out to everyone. Right, but how do we determine? Like I'm looking at one was sent out to Ken Island American Legion and one to Centerville. They American sent it to Legion. everybody. We sent them out and not to the, to the community. And very few times that they respond. Okay, just because there's also the Grayson Bill. I just didn't know how we picked and chose different stakeholders. Yeah. Ms. Wright, do you send that out? No, I do not. Uh, Does that go through Ms. Uh, through Betsy upstairs, Ms. Hoffman? On the, on the committee, I yeah, know. it goes through Ms. Hoffman. I mean, I can ask her why. And I would think anybody that wants to be on that list, that can want to be involved, is better. So I think if anybody has, uh, would like to see that, certainly we could uh, get them in the loop. Do we get good responses back from? If they respond, we get them back, but a lot of times you'll see no response. Okay, thanks. But we do have the two supervisors here who supervise those areas, uh, Ms. Bridget Passon and Ms. Amy Smith, and they can certainly entertain any questions that you might have. Yes, come on. Good evening, President Smith 
and Ms. Pauls, members of the executive team and the board. Welcome, Mr. Schifanelli. Welcome, Ms. Bennett. Um, for the record, my name is Bridget Passan. Uh, my primary role is as the English language arts supervisor for grades three through 12. Um, but for the new board members, please know that uh, content supervisors wear a lot of hats. So I'm here tonight as a policy writer. And one of the policies I was assigned to write for this year is for the advanced placement programs. Um, this is a standard policy. However, we don't have one in place. So this is just, you're probably seeing it all in red on your screen, on your um, paper or on your screen because everything in it is brand new to us. Um, so this just clarifies all that we're doing with our advanced placement programs in both high schools. Um, the policy committee has seen it. Both principals and academic deans have seen it and offered input. Um, I know you've had a chance to look at it. So before it goes out for first read, if you have any questions or comments for me or think about, I'm happy to take them. I did have one question about the policy element. Um, it's the one that's all in red. <laughs> Is it says that students who plan to pursue a bachelor's degree, particularly those who plan to enroll directly in a four-year institution of higher education, is there, I'm just curious as to how that wording came out because it seems as if it would also be deemed appropriate for people who are entering a community college um, or even a student who's pursuing, or is pursuing maybe a workforce uh, apprenticeship. Uh, certainly carpenters need advanced math, certainly um, other trades might need advanced placement. So I was wondering how, about the wording, particularly for a four year. No, I, I think that's an, that's an excellent point to bring up. I think that we do have a partnership with Equal Opportunity Schools and we do encourage all students to take um, an advanced placement course, no matter what their track is. This language does seem to highlight, okay, if you're headed to a four year school, take one because the, um, the rigor of the course and the workload mm -hmm. um, and the pace of it is really going to set you up for what a college course is going to be like. But I think that's a really great first comment to look at that language and be more inclusive of all students, no, mat no matter what their track. So I'm going to make note of that right now. Thank you. For, um, so do I do bring that back for the second read? Yes. When we do the second read, that language is fixed here and you see that adjustment on yes. the... Um, on the notes. Okay, that's policy element A1. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. Uh, thank you for all these hats. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It keeps us on our toes. We'll be meeting next week. Okay. So, and we okay. can bring it up then. Okay. I think it's next week. Great point. Other points or wording that we need to take a second look at? Any other? Not for me. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. I will see you next month. Stay well. Sure, you I know it. Top right here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Vanessa. See you next week. Okay. <laughs> and next we have Miss Amy Smith, who also wears multiple hats. She's going to talk about GT. Thanks, Ms. Passon. Yep. You're welcome. Good evening, President Hello. Smith, Ms. Pauls, board members and executive staff. For the record, I'm Amy Smith, supervisor of K-12 mathematics and gifted and talented. So the policy and um, regulation you have before you is 616 regarding gifted and talented identification and their educational activities and plans. This is um, actually our common practice we have had. And at this point, we just did not have a formal, formal policy in place. And so to meet Comar regulations, we have to have a policy that is stated in our books. So we took on our working plans that we do and we added a few features so that we could actually do some more instructional implementation for our students. Any questions that you may have had as you looked over this? Okay. 
Okay. No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, no. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Thank I you. Want to be that person. Have a wonderful evening. You know, this is not new, but we have a lot of policies that we are trying to get updated, and the way times are changing, some things haven't been done, what, for 10 years? We have some policies on the books that are still back from 1993. So, so they, you know, we're, we're making they a real, obsolete completely. It's, it's, it's not we're trying to inundate anybody, but we're trying to make a real effort to get this thing sum up to the real world sure. and get us in where we should be. Uh, you know, All something right. you can slide by and nothing against past boards, but people probably didn't pay enough attention to it in the past. And then all of a sudden issues come up, we have to address them. So we need to have policies so people know how we how we are gonna deal with things. One policy even says that you can't use the office phone, you have to use the phone in the hallway. Which doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. And it's, no, it doesn't exist And I can't anymore. find that phone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on. Expenditure report. Okay. Good evening, Jane Tower, CFO. This evening we bring before you the detailed expenditure report for period ending 1130. One item of note is that this structure is set up by categories. Categories are mandated by MSDE, categories one through 15. Just to give you an idea, idea, category one is administration. So that's gonna be the superintendent's office, it's gonna be finance, HR. Mid-level is gonna be your principal, school secretaries. And then the rest is pretty well detailed throughout. So on the second page, you'll notice that the approved operating budget for the year was 98,283,128. Available budget um, spent was, is um, gonna be, I'm sorry, um, 81.58, 81%. Is there any questions on the expenditure report? It's, it, I guess it's just an observation. Special education. Yes. I see, you know, some categories were, you know, 300,000, it's, it's I mean, we, that's always been a big problem because you know one or two cases can are we pretty well under control with that so far this year because right. I mean I see movement but then also I do know between salaries and wages a lot of that, a lot of that comes down because we do contractual services exactly you'll see a transfer um, notice of that in, in a couple minutes for salaries to contract wages for 375,000 so th but that's balancing out as far as what right. we don't have on staff we're contracting out because of our, our size yes okay. I hear any other questions or okay? Well, Ms. Towers, do you mind if I ask a question about? Because I'm, I'm assuming the contracts were for these special the speech patho pathologist contracts you've done. So, I guess I'm just thinking how they come up with the numbers because if thirty-seven dollars point said thirty-seven fifty an hour is the max that they can get at seven hours a day for three days a week, it's 21 hours. I think it came to not quite $800. And you multiply that times 4.2, because there's 4.2 weeks, and then you multiply it by 10, and it only came up to about a little more than half of the 58,000. So I'm just wondering how we get our numbers. Um, you also have to take into account fixed charges, and I think that was an hourly rate that was quoted, but then there could be FICA or uh, that they uh, are an additional cost. So maybe it's per hour per hour at 37.50, but then their cost for their fixed charges too have to be included. So I think the hourly rate was provided, but the total cost, it's my understanding that it's it's higher. But I can definitely check on that for you. Thanks. Thank yes, you. Yes, definitely. Sometimes they also put in their mileage. Yes. Which is a hidden cost. If they're assigned to one school and going to another, right. another school. Right. Well, this was just the one school, so that's what, and so. Uh, but they may get charged, they may have going to and from the site. Fortunately, on those invoices, it is, breaking, it is broken down, and there is a process where it does go through um, the supervisor's office, and then it is actually to the finance office for final approval. So we will see the breakdown of each of them. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Okay, moving on to transfers. Um, you have a question? Uh, if I could share one more item. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, um, I, we have the COVID grants. Mm -hmm. We want to provide an update for. So uh, we have broadband. Broadband ends 12:30. This grant here, it's on page one. If you are on board docs, 
uh, the carryover budget was 708,000 spent to date was 54,931. And in reaching out to Mr. Combs about this, this grant was very specific on how the funds were to be spent. They were to um, be spent on a total of possible of 2,500 hotspots. To date, they've only needed 500. So in talking to Mr. Combs, this grant is so specific and as other counties have struggled with the same thing that they cannot, um, they don't have the need for all those hot spots. So their hopes is that when the grant period ends, they're gonna take a look at um, the grant provider and possibly reissue another grant that we would uh, and possibly be able to apply for. See, because that, as I remember, that, that didn't cover the monthly expense on the hot spots. We right. are happy to take care of that. Right, after December 30th, you're absolutely right. Oh, no, even before, as I understood, we were that the cares this cares money wouldn't cover the monthly expense on those hotspots. The monthly expense we were able to allocate to this cares broadband. Oh, it did cover it. Yes. And then Josh got it down from forty dollars a month to fifteen, as I understand. Mm -hmm. And negotiated that, correct? But moving forward, we would have to assume that bill because the grant ends at twelve thirty. Yes. And we can't use this money for it. And this is probably not right, but we can't prepay. Hmm. I, I, no, it's just November and December's. So I mean, we couldn't pay like three months of usage early. It, correct. That time. No. But we will have that that extra money earmarked. We've received that money. We've received it. So we've got it earmarked, and then we can we'll hold it, and hopefully it can be allocated we've done and put into another grant, uh, right. hopefully. Yes, Mr. Combs is, is thinking that that's what they're gonna do because a lot of the other counties have faced a similar situation. And it'd be, it'd be very smart if they did that because why use it wastefully if you can use it for something that needs to be done just to spend it because there's a, a deadline with everything going on. Mm -hmm. So the next one we have here is page two and that is gonna be your um, technology grant. This expires 12:30 as well. This is for a specific hotspot communication. There's 22,000 left, so November and December bills for communication will be used for that allocation, and that will be zero. The next one on page three is going to be your ESSER. This one ends 9:30:22. As you can see to date, the available balance is 175,305. And then on page five, we'll take a look at the CARES tutoring grant. This again ends 1230. There's 17,129. Of that, 8,800 is gonna be for math and PE kits for kids. And then there's an outstanding invoice of around 6,100 from, from our summer recovery program. So that'll spend that out to zero. If we look at the next one, the GEARS funds, this is also another 1230 grant. There's 5,242 left, of which 1,200 is for indirect costs. So we'll go ahead and allocate that. And then the data plan will have other um, charges that we can do for communication for that. So that will be spent out as well. So the Schoology training, the, the tutors, that was under a CARES tutors. Mm -hmm. where, where, which one was that under? Not CARES ESSER. Uh, the, the CARES tutoring on page five has a Schoology in there. And that is through. Because, okay, so you have that in here under as. Under contract services. Under 2,000. 224,000. Let's see. Actually, it's gonna be that um, under category four, the 57,776 in encumbrance. I'm still getting to learn them too, so. Okay. But that's That was just spent this past month. It is um, encumbered. The bill has not been paid yet. Gotcha. The funds are encumbered. Well, I'm talking about the the, the, tr the training for Schoology. Oh, the training for Schoology. I thought you meant Schoology as far as the program no, itself. The training for Schoology. That was 200000 It was 199000 yes, And that came out of CARES? 
Uh, let's see, summer stipend. That I'll have to look into. I, okay, thank you. I can't you. say 100%. Thank you. I'm pretty sure I did. I think they had a PD day. Mm -hmm. Several. They can only train so many people at one time. And we also have to train our subs too, our, for that too, right? That's a question. Yeah, yeah, we come out of that. Yeah, as a part of the contract, we still have some training days left in there. So I met with um, Michael that and Julie yesterday, and they have um, one person per school, and they will organize all of the training um, for the for the rest of their school. And it's by hours, so some of them get four hours, some six hours. It just kind of depends on the size of the school. So that would be an encumbrance still because they haven't been paid for the training. Are we going to be able to hold on to that money? I mean. Well, that one is till to 2021, correct? Yeah, but that's not. That's not that that's, one. Yeah. The one, the, only the one looks like we have an issue with at the end of the year, which is going to, you've addressed. The right. broadband. Right. The broadband. Yeah. Thank you. The next item I bring before you for informational purposes is under special ed category. It is actually reclassifying the salaries to contracted services for the speech occupational therapy um, for the um, positions that were brought tonight. So that's the total of 375,000. Any questions? Nope. You will have to change this letter to address it to Mr. Chris Corcorino, oh. and then put Mr. Smith as the president at the bottom, if you don't mind. Uh, we, well, she, they, no, well, because Mr. Corcorino is now the president of the board, uh, com county commissioners. Uh, Jim can do one last thing. Mm. You so can you. Just oh, please okay. change it. Thank okay. you. Just because of the date. Yes. Yeah, so sorry about that. Thank no, no, you. no. Well, it just all happened. Okay. So we do. We need a. No. Vote to send this over. It's it's just transferring. It's transferring. Okay. It's notice. Within major category. Thank yes. you. Oh, thank, thank you. you for everything. Appreciate thank it. You. Okay, our next thing is um, we've gone over the public comment situation we're in right now. Uh, future school board meetings will be meeting uh, next Wednesday, December the 16th, for our work session, and then our next regular meeting will be January the 6th uh, of 2021. Uh, that's all. Yeah, I just like to um, reiterate the welcome uh, for Mrs. Bennett and Mr. Schifanelli. Thank you. Thank you. And also to congratulate President Smith and Vice President Schifanelli. So. It's a pleasure working with you. Mm -hmm. It's been fun. <laughs> it will be fun. <laughs> Okay, uh, do I have a motion to move into executive closed session? Or to move back into? Um, we just need a motion to reopen closed session. Open closed session. Okay, Mo so moved. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That's the end of our meeting for this evening. Thank you for all attending and watching.